Uh, Caroline says, not familiar with the whole life policy. How does that work to get funds out? Okay, so let's deal with that. So with, uh, I'll use Mass Mutual for example. Mass Mutual, you can either take a loan out via check or direct deposit. They have an app, right? So uh, Mass Mutual has an app you can download on your phone and you could request a loan right from your cash value life insurance policy, direct deposit right to your checking account. Or you can have a check delivered to your, to your house which takes more time. So I usually don't prefer that. I tell people, you know, direct deposit it. So that's the logistics of it. Now let's go over like the, like what happens when I take out a loan, okay? So let's say she wants to take out uh, 10,000, okay? The insurance company, right, is going to charge her an interest rate. Let's say 5%, right? That's what they're gonna charge her on the 10K and that 5% will be simple interest. With Mass Mutual specifically, because every company is different, with Mass Mutual specifically, it's simple interest daily compounded. What does that mean? Let's do some numbers. We've got 123 people in the house. That is awesome. Thank you for being here. So 10,000 times 5% is $500, okay? Divided by 365, she will be paying about $1.36 a day. So simple interest daily compounded, she's gonna get charged $1.36 a day per day for as long as she owes the 10k works just like a personal line of credit home equity line of credit or all in one loan okay it does not work like a credit card where with a credit card it's the same wording simple interest compounded right but on one day it'll be a dollar thirty six the next day it's a dollar thirty nine the next day it's a dollar forty one the next day it's a dollar forty three so it's like you're being charged simple interest compounded where the the original amount keeps compounding itself that is not how this loan will work only credit cards do that to us and that's why paying off credit card debt is so much harder to pay off. Oftentimes when you look at the statement it says, it'll take you 19.5 years to pay off $6,000. And it's like, if you just pay the minimum monthly payment, why is that? Because you're getting charged simple interest compounded daily on not the original balance owed, but on that new balance every single, so it'd be 10,000 $1.36, and then it's $10,000, $3.32, and then it's $10,000, $6. So you keep get charged interest like that. So that is not how this gets calculated. We will get charged $500 for the whole year if I keep the loan outstanding for the whole entire year, okay? At the same point in time that you took out a loan of from your cash value life insurance policy, your 10,000 that's in cash value is now being collateralized, collateralized, can I even say that? It's collateral against the loan. So the insurance company gives you their 10K and they hold your 10K in cash value uninterrupted and it will continue to earn uh, a dividend rate. So for Mass Mutual, 
I believe they're at 6.1%. I think they might go to 6% this year. I'm not sure. So you're going to be earning a gross. There's that word again. You're going to earn a gross rate of return of 6% on this money. Right? Your net internal rate of return is going to be a lot less than 6%. Probably like in the first, actually in the first couple years, you're negative interest. And then after like year three or four, then you start yielding like one, two, three, and then it goes up to like a steady four for a period of time. That's net. So you're going to, you're going to earn a gross rate, but you're going to net a lower rate of return. So if you're wondering, Denzel, isn't that, isn't that less? Well, not exactly. It depends on how you borrow your cash value, or how much, I should say. It really depends on how much you borrow. So let's do an example where if this person has a total of 30,000 in cash value and they only borrow 10 so they're going to be earning an interest rate on all of the cash value as if they never touched it in the first place meanwhile they're getting charged an interest rate over here simple interest right now the other thing that's important to know is when you fund a policy let's say you're doing 30k a year is the max amount where you could run into an issue in terms of taking out loans and say not paying them back where you can run into an issue is if you don't actually pay in 30,000 the the second year or the third, or the fourth, or the fifth. You know, like the, the following years, you only put in 5,000, 2,000, you know, 6,000, 10,000. You're not putting in what the policy was designed originally for. If that's the case, you want to at least pay your interest on your loans so it does not exceed or interfere with the growth of your cash value returns, right? So what happens is you've got two separate things going on. You've got your cash value earning a gross rate of return of say 6%, but you're netting negative in the first one to two, maybe three years. And then in reality, you're only earning 1%, then it goes up to 2, then 3, then 4. We have to understand the amount of money that you're paying in each and every year is not equal to the amount that you borrow out. So a rule that I have in place is I usually do not borrow more than 66% of my total amount of available cash value. So I only leverage a portion of those dollars so that I can go execute those dollars somewhere else and earn a higher rate of return somewhere else outside of the policy, right? And then when I make more money, um, I'm paying an interest rate over here inside the policy. I'm also earning an interest rate. The interest that I earn will go like this right? It'll continue to go higher and higher. And the loan interest will kind of like trail, but it won't match what you're, it'll, it'll trail it where you're not getting charged the same amount or more than what you're earning. Because eventually your money starts to compound. So what ends up happening is the amount of interest that you get charged on your loaned dollars has no effect to what you're earning. Has no effect. Unless, unless 
the policy doesn't perform, the dividends go down, right? That can have an effect. Dividends go down throughout the years. You were, let's say you were illustrated something, but the policy is doing a totally different thing. This goes into policy design and being very educated around the product, making sure you're aware of these things, not borrowing too much money, not overextending yourself, over leveraging. That's where you can run into an issue. Now, the, the way you save yourself, if you're in this kind of position where you're like, oh man, I got too many loans outstanding. I got this, this interest is starting to compound itself. The policy's not, I haven't been max funding it. The best way to save yourself is just restart the interest, like pay down the interest so it stops compounding and kind of resets on whatever the principal amount that you borrowed. That's a good way to save yourself. Um, and then try to earn more money on what you initially used the money for. Did you use it to pay off debt? Okay, you cash flowed, you increased your cash flow, now drive it back into the policy. Continue to max fund. This is why you'll hear me in my videos where I often say max fund over payback loans. Because if I continue to max fund my policy and borrow out a limited amount of funds, the loan interest will, no matter how long I have it outstanding, it'll never exceed the cash value growth. It won't affect the cash value growth. When I go to restore the loans all back to zero, it would have no effect to my cash value, it would have kept growing. I saw one illustration at age 75 drops to 50,000 cash value from 95,000 and the death benefit drops as well. Is it fair? You know what, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, maybe drop the link for everybody to watch and maybe I can take some time to watch that as well so I can get a little more insight on what you're saying I'm wondering if you're saying that the, you said 50,000 cash value from 95. I don't, I don't understand how cash value can drop. I've never seen that happen before in any policy, a good or bad policy. I've never seen cash value go down. I've only seen cash value go up, whether it was a good policy or a bad policy. I've only, I've only seen cash value go up. I've seen death benefit drop off. Yes, that can happen. So for example, you could have a policy where you start off with a million dollars and you're max funding it for the first seven years, first 10 years, first 14 years. And then that next year that you're done funding, the term rider that you had on there drops off. You no longer need a uh, term insurance on your whole life policy because you're no longer max funding. You've, you've finished that period, let's just say and now you're just PUAs and base premium. So the death benefit might drop to, I don't know, 900,000 or 750,000 for a period of time and then it gradually starts to go back up again, okay? So is it fair? It's a matter of how do you want your policy designed? Because there's many different ways to do it. So fair, not the right question, is it effective? Is that effective to have my policy do that? Or would that be ineffective? If it's ineffective, is there another way? And we want to do it that way. We want to ask that question. Can you continue to fund the policy while you have a loan outstanding from the policy? Yes. I have 60,000 in loans in my policy. I have 131,000 in cash value. My anniversary date is coming up in June. So I'm gonna dump 70,000 on my anniversary date, right? I'm gonna dump 70,000 and I'm still gonna have, you know, the loan outstanding. So I can continue to fund the policy, max fund it without having to pay the loan or the interest. I can leave that just there. It's, it's a loan that I never really have to pay back. In my personal finance and situation, I'm not paying back those loans until the sixth or seventh year. Sixth or seventh year, I'll have about over a quarter million in loans, and then I'm gonna write a check to restore the loans all back to zero, max fund the policy, and then I'm gonna take out another big, one big loan of like 400,000 and go buy multifamily real estate.
That's the plan. Can you do an example with an all-in-one loan? Do you use the 66% rule with that policy funding with an all-in-one loan? No, no, I do not. That would be different. See, with a uh, with with an all-in-one loan, it's a little bit different because the intent, if you get an all-in-one loan, is to technically pay off the the debt of that mortgage, right? So if you get a all-in-one loan, I don't know for. 500,000, right? Let's say you replaced your $500,000 mortgage with a $500,000 all-in-one loan, but but you had like 200k in equity. So, I don't know, maybe your credit limit is uh, a little bit. I don't think all in loan. I don't think all in one loan works like that. So I don't want to put that. I don't want to be incorrect on that. I think it might be, but I don't want to be wrong. So we'll have to do some more research on that. I'm still learning about these things. But if I am, I had one client do this, where she replaced her mortgage with an all in one loan, right? So let's say it's 500K is the starting amount, and now she's gonna, you know, do velocity banking. All income goes in, expenses, you know, come out, cash flow stays, right? So we're doing velocity banking on the product itself, the all in one loan. We're doing velocity banking on the debt tool. The, the client that I was working with, um, she's, you know, looking to put a policy in place. I think she was looking to fund like 100K a year, right? So what she did was she dumped 100K into the all-in-one loan, had it sit there for a period of time while she learns about infinite banking, put a policy in place, you know, design different illustrations. She can have her money parked in the all-in-one loan safely, reducing her interest costs in that. When she's ready to deploy the funds, she'll pull it back out you know, fund the policy, borrow out money, and then ideally invest, okay? So when we're doing velocity banking and infinite banking together, we have to still always base our numbers of what we're gonna fund, we base it off our four major numbers, okay? So let's let's get some clarity with that first. Let's make sure we're, we're understanding that correctly, that it's still based off our numbers. So if I have a HELOC at 25K, that's my debt tool that I'm gonna leverage. 66%, right, is 16.5. My cash flow is 2,000 a month, two times 12, 24,000 a year is my yearly cash flow. Anywhere between 24,000 and 165 is what I should fund into a policy if I'm at that point. If I'm trying to figure out, okay, how much should I fund a policy? So I can either be conservative, fund a policy below my cash flow like this client did, 16,500, right? They're gonna cash flow 24K in a year. When we initially funded the policy, they were not cash flowing 2,000, it was probably like 1,500, so I think they were at like 18K. So between 18K and 16.5 was the number we were kind of at. And that's why they created that extra space because they figured they'd be cash flowing more later down the line. So, you know, you can design a policy like that. But when we're deciding on how much to fund a policy, what you don't want to make the mistake of 
is saying, oh, my cash flow is this a year and I can leverage 16.5, okay? I've done some videos in the past where I, I went over this. In very rare cases, does that make sense? In most cases, it does not because the likelihood of that person being disciplined enough to leverage like that, typically they got a couple more zeros behind their income. You know what I mean? Like they're making higher money so they understand how to leverage. But when I'm dealing with people that are making like, you know, eight grand, six, five, four, three, you know, K a month, let's not get too excited on, on, on this, this leveraging. Let's make sure we, we want to leverage. We want to multiply our dollars, use $1 more than once, but not over leverage, put us in a bind. You know, infinite banking is great, but let's not put that on a high pedestal. Because remember, I would rather you 10x first, get the capital, then drive it into the policy, than to take all your cash flow in a year, plus leveraging a debt tool to try to throw in, you know, a thirty, forty thousand dollar policy when you only make eighty grand a year. That's fifty percent of your income that may not be as effective. Can it work? Yes, it certainly can. It's certainly, I'm not saying it won't. I'm just saying the likelihood of people doing that, going that far, you better know your numbers and you better not rely on some kid that's 25 years old, right? Like just being totally transparent. You better know your numbers. You better understand the concept very well and know what you're getting into and not get sold into a product such as cash value life insurance. You better know what you're doing. Is it worth to take 20,000 from HELOC to put them in the whole life insurance then at once take 15,000 from the insurance as loan to pay tuition fees? No, probably not. I don't like that. So that means I'm going into debt 20,000 from the HELOC to fund a policy to then borrow 15,000, that's more than 66%. That's, that's, that's affecting with my, my, my rule of borrowing. So if I do a $20,000 a year policy, right? That's not a big policy, 20,000 a year. Let's say it's a 90-10 split. So 2,000, right? I'm only gonna have 18K left. Then you have uh, term costs. Say that's a, I don't know, 400 bucks, 600 bucks or so. Then you have sales load charge. Then you've got PUA fee. So maybe you net, maybe your starting cash value is, uh, say, say it's 16.5. Starting cash value. Well, from that, you can only borrow roughly up to, it might be like 88, 89% in the first year, but you can only borrow up to 90% in the first year. So 16.5 times 90% is 14,850 dollars. So if you were to borrow out technically all of your cash flow, say it's 15K that you have the ability to borrow out in the first year, and you borrow all 90%, to then go pay a tuition fee. Now, what do I get out of paying that tuition fee, that tuition fee up front in advance? What do I get from doing that? What is my ROR, my rate of return? What, what is my, am I earning anything back on that? Because if I'm not, which I know you're not, there is no savings by paying tuition up front, right? There, what am I saving on? I'm just paying a bill, right? So not only did I borrow 20,000 at an interest rate, that's a cost. Then I threw it into a whole life, 20 grand, lost 2K right off to the start, lost another four to 600 term costs, another couple hundred bucks, couple hundred bucks PUA. I've got starting 16.5, lost another 10%. I only got 15K to use and I leveraged the whole thing, 
remember, I got a, I have a loan interest on that. So I'm paying loan interest on the HELOC, loan interest on the loan. I save nothing by paying the tuition. It would be a different story if that 15000 could guarantee me a 20% rate of return or something like that, or a 10% rate of return so it can make up for this cost and the HELOC cost and all that. Then maybe. But I don't like the idea of it just by running the numbers. And that's all you got to do, my friend. Run those pretty little numbers until you get what you got to get to. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? What is the difference between direct and non-direct when starting a policy? Great question. So, Mass Mutual is a non-direct. I believe they can turn into a direct later on, if I'm not mistaken. So non-direct simply means I take out that $10,000 loan at 5% and let's say I got 30,000 in cash value, earning 6%. Mass Mutual is not going to recognize they're not going to non-direct recognition. They're not going to recognize that I have this $10,000 loan. They're going to keep crediting me the same rate of return on my total 30K as if I never borrowed the 10 to begin with. Okay? A direct recognition. I take out 10 grand. The Loan interest rate is 5%. Let's say I got 30K in cash. Um, let's say, you know what? Let's say, the, let's say the loan interest rate is 6% with this direct recognition company, different, different uh, insurance company. Let's say on 30K cash value, the dividend rate is 5.8%, okay? With a direct recognition, the insurance company is recognizing that Denzel just took out a $10,000 loan, we're gonna charge him 6%, but on that same 10,000, we're gonna credit him 6%. So we're gonna match what we're charging him versus what we're crediting him. We're gonna match the same rate, and then the other $20,000 is going to earn 5.8%. That's how direct recognition usually works. Some companies, the rates might be different, but that is the, the gist of it. Okay, hopefully that helps. The designer should design the policy, not the clients. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. So yes, the case designers at the insurance agency is designing the policy, yes, for sure. But you as the client, kind of like buying a car, you're saying, hey, I want floor mats, I want three cup holders, I want six USB plugins, I want, you know, TVs in the back, I want, you know, uh, uh, leather seats, red interior, black outline, chrome finish, LED lights, all the bells and whistles. You as the client need to know what to ask for so that the designer can create what you want. That's why it's very important that you guys that want policies in place for yourself, you want to get very educated, not sold a strategy of infinite banking. Because that's what an insurance agent is there to do. They're there to sell you on the policy. But you as an educated customer watching these videos, you're coming equipped. You're like, hey, Mr. Mrs. Agent, I want this, 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 and this. Can you design it, yes or no? She says, he says, yes, cool comes back, they provide a design, 
you watching all the videos you watch, you know how an illustration is supposed to look like. And you look and you say, hey, Miss, Mr. Agent, that's not what I want. I want this, this, and this. Can you design it? Yes or no? Final warning? Yes? Okay. So they go back. They give you another policy. You look at it again. You're like, you know what, Mr. Agent, I don't think we're in alignment. I, I don't like this design. Um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to look elsewhere. Have a nice day. That's it. No need to argue, right? No need to fight, fuss, try to prove one another wrong. If they don't do what you want, why are you still there? <laughs> right? It's like being in a relationship and, you know, they operate one way that's totally out of alignment to your morals, ethics, values, behaviors. Why are you still with them? All right, next question. If you have $50,000 in cash and wanting to open up a high cash value life insurance, is it better to fund for a uh, account on, on, on kids or use the money to fund my policy alone? Which option do you think will be better off? I guess based on where that 50,000 is coming from. So is the 50,000 capital? Is it a lump sum? Is it a, is it a, uh, what's the term? Oh my God. Is it a windfall of cash? Or are you cash flowing 50,000 a year conservatively? If you're cash flowing 50,000 a year conservatively, I think we could easily fund a policy on yourself. And then based on the cash value, based on the age of your, of your kid or kids, I'm assuming they're young. If they're under the age of 18, you know, you, you really can't put too much insurance anyways. And by the way, in order to put a policy on a child under the age of 18, you have to have, you mom or dad, has to have life insurance anyways, and then they take 50% of death benefit, and that's what you can insure on your child. So what you could do, which I have a lot of my clients do, is they, they take the 50K, they fund the policy on themselves, and then they borrow, and then they put a policy on kid number one, kid number two, kid number three. So the same 50K funded your policy and funded all other three policies. It's the same cash value, right? So that means the next year when you dump 50K in, you borrow money out, you fund kid one, kid two, kid three. So now the whole kingdom is protected, okay? That's a cool way of looking at it. Hopefully that helps. God bless you. Who is the best mutual whole life insurance company? That's very hard to, to tell. I would say that's, that's gonna be an opinion. And anyone that gives a name, so I could say Mass Mutual, Guardian, New York Life, Northwestern, those are the four major mutual life insurance companies, Mass Mutual, Guardian, New York Life, and uh, Northwestern. In terms of profit, in terms of revenue, in terms of uh, financial stability uh, and, and size, they're the biggest. And then you have a bunch of smaller ones. You've got Penn Mutual, uh, Security of Security Mutual, Mutual of Omaha. You got Lafayette. These are the common ones that get used by a lot of uh, uh, insurance agents. You got Pacific Life. A lot of IUL uh, agents use that. Alliance. Um, there, there's so many. I think what it, and, and each, I would say each insurance company has their, maybe like their target market or how they do certain things. So before you just get a policy based on what some 25 year old kid said, why not do the research, see how these policies stack up, how do they work, how do they operate, does that align with my personal financial situation and mission to become financially free. Does it solve for that? 
Citi calls these flex loans, charges a lower rate than the usual credit card rate for them, but is it an amortized rate or is it a simple interest rate? We wanna find that out. I'm gonna assume you're asking, you know, which one's better. Um, I really don't look at it that way. I look at, I, me personally, I own both. So I, I own both and when I'm talking to clients, typically those are the companies that I use most of the time. So, you know, I have one with Mass Mutual and I got one with Guardian. I like them both. I would say Guardian is great for people who have, you know, your, your uh, hourly plus commission, right? So your income fluctuates. So if you have fluctuating income, you get big bonuses randomly throughout the year. You have a side gig, side hustle. So your income's always like going up and down. Guardian's probably gonna be a little bit better because you can you can set a funding amount, say 50K a year, right? Or shoot, you can go even as you can go as high as you want, 500 k a year. I was just talking to a guy uh, that just funded a policy, 500,000 a year. I got a client that just funded a policy, uh, 250,000 a year. So you can go as high as you want based on your age, health, and finances. But however much you say want to fund a policy, you could set that number and with Guardian, let's say you do it the first year but you're not able to do it the second, the only thing you're, you're really, um, you only have to fund, pay for the premium, the base premium, say it's like 5K plus the term cost to keep the term writer in force so that you can add PUAs, you're able to dump in the other 45 grand at leisure through the mobile app at any given time without any issue. With Mass Mutual, it's a little bit more of a process. You have to inform the insurance company what you're trying to do. And you can typically only add in funds around the anniversary date, 30 days before, 30 days after. Those are the major differences. Mass Mutual has a higher dividend rate than Guardian. Mass Mutual is bigger than Guardian. Guardian is a little more flexible. Guardian has a um, has kind of like an IUL feature where your money could grow in the index so you can earn up to 12.5% gross as opposed to just the dividend. So Guardian has a design where you could have a whole life and an IUL together as one. So Guardian does have that feature attached to their whole life products. That could be a benefit. Maybe that interests you, the potential, not the guarantee, but the potential to earn higher, um, a higher internal rate of return than just the standard dividends of the, of the company.